Hello and welcome back to The Real Music Talks. Today's guest is Jason, another singer-songwriter from the UK. How are you doing, Jason? I'm not so bad, thank you. Thanks for having me on. No worries. Absolute pleasure. Um, so for people that don't know you, how would you describe yourself and your involvement in the music industry? All right, so um, I mean, I started playing guitar very young, about the age of six, um, which would have been the late 70s. And um, I was always kind of more obsessed with recording more than anything else. And I used to sort of try and experiment, bouncing things backwards and forwards to tape machines, never really getting a good result. So it was always a real obsession to record music and, and sort of build up the parts. So I was kind of into things like um, Two Bit of Bells and Mike Oldfield and the whole process of multi-tracking. Um, but I got into, into bands initially on guitar, but then I switched to drums. Um, and I was in quite, you know, sort of classic rock bands, I suppose. and um, reasonably heavy I suppose but melodic at the same time I was always into a, a real sort of broad mix of influences back then from Motown to country to sort of southern rock and prog rock queen and all that sort of stuff so there was a real mix of influences in there but I stayed on drums and percussion for, uh, for a good sort of 20-25 years I got a nice little number um, drumming for Michael Bruce who's an ex Alice Cooper group uh, guitarist and so we did a couple of UK tours in the early 2000s and then out to Los Angeles to play at the Whiskey so that was great a uh, really good experience and then I sort of just decided to go solo after that so um, back on guitar started doing a few acoustic gigs um, I love to sort of write in that way anyway with acoustics and um, the sound sort of developed from there so it's a real mix of sort of acoustic rock country blues folk and 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 so i sort of budget as americana fusion now so it's a kind of mixture of all those things clearly i'm of, of a certain age um and i decided last year when i turned 50 to really start um pushing it again i've got loads and loads of material all sort of queuing up and decided to sort of hook up with um scarlet river and rachel um and we've got a great sort of collection of musicians and recording opportunities around Staffordshire so to really start pushing it and getting it all out there. Really interesting so you said like the initial kind of passion was really around recording talk to me about that a little bit what what was it about recording that you really loved? Um, it all, all sort of looked really romantic and um, you know I love this gear around you and lots of gadgets and stuff like that and, um, and actually my first experience in the studio was was at the sort of tail end of uh, the old reel to reel stuff, 24 track tape. And it really was like that. So it was almost like being locked away in a different world. Uh, all of this gear really sort of mesmerizing. And, and also just the amazing results of going in with some fairly rudimentary and mediocre equipment back in the day, we didn't have great gear. And, and these guys managed to sort of make it sound amazing. So, so you come out really proud of your demo tapes. And I just love being in those environments. So, um, it was all this sort of desire to have my own studio, but of course these days, much smaller or predominantly digital, uh, but still some nice, um, nice bits and pieces. But I do love recording and that creative process of building something up from scratch. Um, and you mentioned that you used to be a drummer, right? And now you transitioned into solo stuff. You know, I'm a drummer myself, so I get that. But what, um, what was that like making that transition? How did you find it, and how did you like expand your skill set almost when you did that? Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, I do um, drums and guitar are reasonably strong. Um, bass, also love a good bass line. So um, I quite like sort of putting those parts together. But of course, when you go out if, as a solo artist, or, or sometimes I take a, a, a mate with me and we do either extra bass or guitar, you've got to then kind of try and get the material across in a very stripped back way. Um, I must admit, I do sort of make use of some like loop gadgets and things like that just to enhance the sound of uh, just two people on stage and just put a little bit more texture in there but it was quite nerve-wracking going back to the front of the stage it was quite comfortable it's like a comfy pair of slippers almost being behind the kit and didn't really get worried about it but just after sort of 25 years of doing that and experience all the sort of stage nerves again was was very strange and um, and even now um I'm still not quite as comfortable sitting at the front than I, than I was at the back. 
Yeah, I get it. Because even though you're completely in the music as a drummer, right? Like ultimately, you're not the center of attention, and you are kind of like hiding behind that front man and the other people in the band. So, yes, you are on stage, but it's not quite that same level of pressure, almost. Yeah, it's funny. I always, uh, even as a, I, I, I sort of sit down with a guitar because um, you know I can't kind of like that look of being on perched on the stool and being a bit more chilled out and cool. But it's also an excuse to surround yourself with more um, sort of screens and sort of guarding stuff a little bit of all this, all this equipment. Yeah, for sure. Um, and how did you like learn all these other instruments? It'd be good to maybe hear like, you know, have you had any like musical training or is it you've always learned from like listening to your favorite songs and like picking those up? Talk me through that process for you personally. I think when I started guitar, I had some, some guidance. Um, my school teacher at the time was a guitar player and a multi-instrumentalist. And so he gave me my first sort of rudimentary lessons. Uh, it was all very much folk. Um, I still keep in touch now, even though that was the late seventies. So that's great. I did do a few classical guitar lessons, uh, did grades one to four. So I did learn to read music and, and sit the grades as maybe 11 year old or something like that. But I never really sort of seriously continued down that path. I was more by ear. Um, drumming was all by ear. I can pick my way through the piano a little bit by ear. And, and, and in some ways, um, you get, you get some interesting results by not being quite so sort of traditional and, um, you know, sticking to the sort of scales and things like that. So I just play with it a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. I've, I've spoken to people about it on this podcast before, right? Like when you're too classically trained, you end up being quite rigid in how you put things together. Whereas people at the other end of the spectrum, they're looking at it purely from like an expression and emotional and creative lens. So it can kind of impact you. And I think either way can hinder you a little bit almost because you kind of need that like basic musical understanding to really express yourself. But on the other side, if you go too far into theory, et cetera, and like sight reading and all that, then it can kind of hinder your creativity almost. Yeah, I think there's a reasonable mix in there. Um, it's probably 20% um, classical and 80% uh, sort of play by ear. And um, But the good thing about the technology these days as well, of course, is that um, there was a piece in, in one of the songs that I just finished and uh, there was a bit of orchestra in there, so a bit of brass and some strings. And so I was able to sort of piece that all together using MIDI and print the score out, send it to real musicians and uh, they come and record it. And it's pretty, just amazing, mind-blowing. Yeah, I guess, you know, like the experience that you had in the music industry, it's amazing to see those kind of like innovations because things like that would be so much harder to do like 34 years ago. Whereas now it feels like it's so easy and quick. So what do you think about how the music industry has changed? Maybe like from a personal perspective to like the pros and cons sort of thing. I suppose on on the recording side, um, you you would have to go in well rehearsed. Um, it was really expensive. You got the tracks down and you left. Um, and if you got enough money, you might, might go back for another remix or whatever. But um, and so, in the, from a sense of how things are today, you almost get the the ability to forever mess around with it, um, which can be a hindrance. And but also a chance to really sort of make it um, special, make it well presented like painting um and also to sort of email things around between people nowadays as well and um, that, that's great so from that perspective i think that's that's really good and then we're all kind of on a level playing field when it comes to how well presented your tunes will be now compared to a probably a kind of a very rough demo back in the day um because it was just so expensive but um conversely um you know you're a a little fish in a very big pond of lots and lots and lots of people doing it now. Um, you know, back in the day, you would go playing at your local venues. You've got a good following. They buy your merchandise, they buy your cassettes, and all that sort of stuff. It's very hard now to really even stand out, isn't it? Um, but yeah. absolutely, it's pros and cons. I mean, like if you're starting out as a musician, you can quite easily just put something out there like very quickly. Whereas before, it would take you time to like craft out enough songs for an ep or something to actually go in and record it or you know save up the money for it or so it's it's kind of like to change the process almost but then you also have like people that are the opposite end of the spectrum where they could spend more time than they do homing the music that they're putting out there 
rather than just like dropping single every month, which does happen, that yeah. actually they haven't really refined their sound and the music they're creating. Yeah, and I found since we, we started this campaign um, around the middle of last year, so we've got three singles out in that time. So we're not really sort of um, belting them out. There's a big queue of stuff to get out, um, but we're trying to sort of build the following, get people interested in what's happening. Um, there is a desire to do sort of a video for each track as well, which can be time consuming and expensive. Uh, but at the same time, I think you know, it's all about the presentation and um, as good as it can be. Uh, as I say, I'm aware that my influences are probably a bit broad. And sometimes you have to spend a bit of time thinking about, is this really going to land well with the listener? Yeah, it'd be good to hear maybe like, especially with your solo career, how have you gone about like finding your sound? If you've got all those influences, it's quite difficult to kind of narrow it down or do you just kind of like make every track different almost if that makes sense i suppose um one of the ways that it came around um being a solo acoustic artist and i sort of turned myself as an acoustic artist i do use electric guitars but the, the formula is always to start off with a acoustic bass drums um, and take it from there to see if one the song and the melody is any good um, but also I quite enjoyed the sort of, it was a span in the 90s where everybody was doing Unplugged and, and actually I thought, you know what, for the first time I hear what they're singing in that song and that's a really good song and um, I kind of like that sound, it's, it can be as impactful and as strong as you like even without too many sort of really distorted guitars um, and I do like a good heavy guitar now and again um, but I think it's, um, that's how that song, that sounds kind of morphed from those kind of sessions and thought, yeah, I like the way that sounds and that's the way I write. So I'm going to keep going with that. Yeah. That's an interesting point, you know, like, and I've had this as a drummer, like if you're in a rock band, especially, and everyone is pushing the envelope in terms of volume, you know, it becomes harder and harder to distinguish all the different parts. And I feel like that's a journey you go on when you record, especially if you've just done it for the first time as a band, you can really listen to everyone else's parts and understand where the opportunities are a little bit better. Whereas say, you know, if you're in a practice room and everyone's blasting it, it can be quite difficult at times. Oh God, yeah. Uh, I mean, I've, I've got many injuries and, and sort of long-term effects of being a drummer. So um, lots of uh, lots of big lumps on knuckles where I've hit rims and blood all over the skin and things like that. And also uh, very, very loud ringing in my ears constantly. <laughs> Definitely ruin myself. <laughs> I'm trying my best to avoid that with uh, hearing protection and that, but... You know, it's tricky because say like if I go and watch a, a live gig, I still struggle to, with it because if you get like the cheap one plugs and you put them in, it's not the same sound, but then you're still doing some sort of damage to your hearing. So <laughs> it's a tricky balance. That's it. And then, you know, these days I've taken to wearing sort of earbuds rather than having huge wedge monitors in front of me, which I think just concentrates a little bit more on, on, on the vocal performance. And, and even then I can be left with my ears ringing after having them in all night. You just can't win. Absolutely. Um, so it'd be good to hear, obviously, we talked about like your whole journey a little bit. Maybe like talk about your journey as a solo artist, like when you first started, how it's been so far, what have the gigs been like? What is like the next steps as well from there? Yeah, well, it, it started in sort of um, 2012, probably. And um, I just started with a four track demo. Um, got a bit of a promoter, went out and did a few solo shows. It's not great, I must admit, in the area that I am in at the moment to get um, to get a gig with original music. And I kind of morphed back into to doing acoustic covers just to really keep my hand in, being used to being on stage. And there have been very few opportunities to do original stuff in this area. Hence why... Um, and then two albums in. So there's there's an album on Spotify, there's another one about to come out, and the third one's been written. I thought, this is silly, all of this stuff's just sitting there, and, and I can't really get anywhere to play. So that's why I started to engage with, with um, Rachel, really, to see if we can start to, to plan that through. So, you know, one is to get a bit of a following, second one is to get some music out there and heard, and, and we're starting to try and get a few more shows booked now to, to go out and do a bit of um, a bit more live. I've got a support slot coming up with uh, Sarah Riches at the Jam House in Birmingham, April 19th. So that'll be the first time this year 
properly going out and doing a doing a live performance. That's exciting stuff. And, and like you said, you've got loads of material there. It's just working out like how to market it. And, you know, I think for people listening as well, you know, if there isn't a huge music scene in your local area, you might have to travel, you know, like where's the nearest city? Where's the, the next opportunity to go to? Because most cities do have a good music scene. It's just finding like your way in almost, if you know what I mean. That's it. And then it's and it's kind of genre as well. Whereas I was, I was really kind of um, trying to avoid being pigeonholed. Um, but I think you have to kind of put yourself somewhere in the end. So, and it was somebody else's suggestion um, in a few conversations a couple of years ago that said the stuff you're writing is probably more akin to Americana country than it is to classic rock now. So you've kind of morphed from one to the other over time. And there's a lot of similarities anyway, as we know, in the structures and, and, and really it comes down to production and um, style, doesn't it? Vocal style and things like that. So I think I've probably still got a little bit of rock in there, but um, it's I think it works, um, keeping it nice and stripped back and clean and presentable. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, if that sound is, works for you and you've naturally taken your music there, it doesn't really matter. Like at the end of the day, the genres are just kind of like labels that we put on things anyway. And actually, it's all just music. And there's always like the new genres that come out that are different constraints between and merges between other genres. But it's all yeah. music at the end of the day. It's just about what are the elements, how you're using those elements almost. That's it. And if you think about what's bounced backwards and forwards between us and America, um, since the since the dawn of America as we know it today, um, they probably started off with Irish folk music and enhanced it a bit, and then then started with a bit of blues and then merged them a bit, and it's it's come back over the pond, and we we took it, and then they the Beatles took it back and give it them. Yeah, it just it just goes back and forth. It's really interesting. Yeah, for sure. And like even genres go around in cycles. You know, it's just like trends with fashion. It's exactly the same thing. Punk comes back again. Dance music comes back again in a big way, and it just goes in these trends. So things never really go out of fashion. Really, they just have certain like ex exponential growth areas of popularity. If you know what I mean. That's right. And what I did with the last single um, letter, it was already kind of written, recorded, and ready to release. And then I, at the last minute, I just um, sort of challenged the guys at the studio to say have a play with that, see if you come up with a different mix of it or, or some different textures. And they they sort of stripped it back again and added some more layers and probably modernised it slightly from where it was originally. I'm not going to try and jump on a particular bandwagon because I think if you do, you tend to miss it. Um, but at the same time, being aware that um, you know people do pick on the fact that my stuff sounds a little bit dated. Um, and that was quite deliberate because I wanted to be retro and the good time songs that I remember. Um, but at the same time, trying to at least make the effort to put a bit of a modern presentation and production on it. Certainly makes sense. And I think, you know, leading on from that, it'd be good to hear more about your songwriting process, um, especially how that might have changed as well. Like what is your typical process or does it vary with each song? Just tell me more about that. Um, typically I'll start with something will start happening in the head and I've got a bit of a melody going on and um, I'll pick a guitar up and just try and try and put down a few roots of basic chords and, and, and a bit of a melody and just sort of sing some nonsense into my voice recorder. I suppose that's changed now because the technology is available. Um, else back in the day, I suppose writing was normally a, a sort of collaborative process and it was almost like a challenge to really get your your bit of the pie into the, the finished article. Else now, I think with the technology, it's easy to come back to it later. You, you've captured that moment and can come back to it later and maybe even merge some of those things together. Um, and then from that point, really, get the basic demo around that and, and start thinking about how, where, is, where is it going to go? What's the subject? Get the lyrics finished off. And, um, and who else you might want to invite onto that? So there's things like pedal steel, on one of the tracks, a great player, local to us, who, who gets around called um, Chris Hillman, um, and, and whatever else, I might fancy putting a few textures on there. It's just really kind of experimental. And the nice thing is you never really know how it's going to turn out, um, as as you would uh, put a bit of a, a painting. Um, you might just rub a bit of it out and try again. <laughs> 
yeah, it's a constantly evolving process. Like when you first write the song, it could by the end it could take a completely different form and even a different meaning. You know, like it can go in a different direction. And I think when you work with other artists or producers or engineers, sometimes they can help you find those sort of creative ideas that you might not have thought of before. Um, so yeah, talk to me a little bit about that. Actually, how have you collaborated with other musicians during your career so far? Yeah, I think. Um sort of back in the day in in the early years with bands and things like that we would um there'd always be a couple of strong songwriters in the bands um it was very rare that all four or five members would be strong in that sense and so it, it used to be good to to have that and and me being a sort of previous guitarist and then on drums um it was an interesting spin on things to to have a, a sort of songwriting drummer in the band as well with with the, the kind of notion of, yeah, I want to get plenty of drums in this, but I also want to influence the, the tune as well. Whereas these days, um, I've gone full circle. I've gone to sort of writing on my own for many years and now looking for collaboration again. So I've reached out to a couple of other UK country artists. Um, there's potentially a couple of collaborations coming up in that space. But also I've been doing a little bit of work finishing off tracks for various people. And they come to me and say, well, I've got this chorus. Um, can you put a verse around it? So that's nice. I'm starting to branch out a little bit more in that sense. And um, the, the guys that I work with in the studio, Matt and Tom Bishop, originally I taught them <laughs> to play their first uh, few chords on guitar because they're about 10 or 12 years behind me. Um, but now they're fully fledged, excellent session players and uh, Sometimes I bounce a few things off those guys as well, which is great. They can be brutally honest with me. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like sometimes you can be clouded by your own judgment of a track. Like you might think this is a really good song and then someone else comes along and says, you know, that one's trash. Actually, this song would be a way better single. And you're yeah. like, really? I, I don't know if I believe you. But then sometimes you like analyze it and you're like, actually, I can see why it makes sense to me now. Yeah. And the other thing we did um, on the last single was there was three kind of um, slower ballady songs um, and we we stuck them on social media put some clips on there bits of verse and chorus and just asked the followers to to say what's what's your favorite out of these three uh, and um, then we'll draw your name out of hat and we'll send you a free t-shirt <laughs> so it was a bit of an incentive to, to actually give an opinion but it worked and it was interesting yeah stuff like that's a really good way of drawing attention to yourself and helping your fan base as well so like it's always worth doing promos like that. Um, be good to hear from you as well. Drawing on all your experience, say if someone was starting out in today's modern music industry, what advice would you give them? Maybe like drill out a couple of like key pieces of advice based on what you've learned so far. Yeah, it's a good one. That um, I, I sort of mentioned it earlier, really. Is try not to sort of jump on any trends. I mean, if, if you've got a, an ear for music and you like creating, stick with what you think is right yourself. And, and follow that through because um, ultimately I think uh, if it's a good piece of music as we said earlier then, then someone will like it and um, you, you know I, I've got a, a son now that's starting out in um, in bands and uh, they're kind of jumping on bandwagons and, and saying the same thing by the time you get noticed that trend will have gone so just write what you want to write and, and see what it sounds like and, and play with it and be creative yeah, I think that's a very good point. It's it's quite easy to do that. But ultimately, it's not a case of, you know, um, is this the right trend? It's more about like finding the right audience for your music. There's always an audience out there that like what you do, especially if you're doing, you know, good quality music, well written, well thought out, well produced, etc. You know, like you've got a quality product. You could, it's the same as like a business, right? It's just finding the right customer for that product, if that makes sense. Exactly that. Um, I'm still struggling with that one. Uh, I, I sort of uh, had this theory that there'd be some more people like me that like stuff that's probably uh, a bygone era, um, but like a modern touch. Um, but what's difficult, I suppose, is that where is the audience? So if you went to the, one of the local clubs, they're probably not going to be there. Um, if you went on TikTok, they're probably not going to be there either. So it's difficult to find where they actually are. Um, Obviously, they do go on social media and they do react, and there's a reasonable following. And um, yeah, it is difficult. 
So it's um, it's in, it's an interesting process anyway. At the end of the day, I think the advantage we do have in the modern world with things like social media is it gives us like data and stats and like actual like insights and feedback on what we're doing. You know, we can put music out there. We can see my top fan base is in X locations and they're this age group and stuff like that, which would have been much harder to do years ago than it is today. So that really does help us find that audience quicker, I guess. But then also on the other side, everyone's doing it and everyone's putting social media content out there and people are advertising more online and, you know, so you get flooded and bombarded with more and more people trying to get your attention as a consumer. And that's kind of the challenging part. But I think if the message is good, then you can still stand out. Yeah, that's true. Um, it's it's trying to balance that content, enough content and interest without, as you say, absolutely bombarding people. Um, the stats were interesting. I think the audience were a little bit younger than we first expected. Um, the other thing about it was that um, when we look at what, where things are being played, playlisting, etc., then actually um, South America was coming up on top, like uh, followed by the States and Maybe that's just the size of the country, the, the sort of interest in music, and maybe again, it's it's quite a, a following of older music in that in that respect as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think the stats and the data work quite well. Yeah, for sure. There's often surprises, like you said, where it's like demographics that I wouldn't have even thought of. And then it's like, okay, it, it changes your approach a little bit because you're like, okay, maybe I can actually appeal to this audience a little bit more. I didn't even know there was an audience there in that segment. So yeah, it goes, does give you that like different way of thinking of things. Um, so, you know, you've started your solo career now. What's the plans for the future from here for you? Well, we've got... Um the rest of the album to get out at the end of this year so I think we've, we've done a few teasers and radio edits of tracks from that album um, there's a lot of stuff on there that probably isn't single material but still of interest and I think it's it's all, all sits kind of nicely in that Americana genre so that's called Train Rolls On that'll be out October um, hoping to get this collaboration underway with one or two other artists and then into next year I'll probably um, we've got a 10 or 12 new songs. I'm not sure whether to go with singles, EPs or albums. And um, I think, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens next year. I think it's, I think it's a matter of seeing where we are by the time the album goes out. Yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, it, it, we've had a couple, you know, a tough couple of years anyway with like COVID and all these different changes and the economy and all that stuff. So things are still uncertain, but I think, in those sort of times people turn to music more and more as a way of bringing people together and i think since covid I, i've definitely seen that like a surge of interest in gigs and concerts and festivals and bands coming coming out wanting to play again and selling out like that so you know there's definitely a lot of opportunity coming up absolutely um i i, I sort of you know i wonder about artists like myself that are probably a little bit more mature now um, in a different part of the or a different end of the career, it's still kind of the same energy and, and excitement and also the desire to to get heard and to get a following. But the opportunities to jump on the road and do 20 dates in a row now are, are slim. So it's, it's trying to get that balance. Yeah, exactly. I get that. You, you can't go like full pout at you, where you're at in your life. Do you know what I mean? It's not like you can drop everything and just go on tour constantly. So it's like getting the balance of what you can do. But when you love something like music, um, you know, the passion alone and the enjoyment is like enough, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, and, and actually, you know, when you look at the, the sort of opportunities with recorded music as well and, and things like sync and advertising, and that's another avenue that we want to try and push um, as we go into next year as well to see if we can get some more, more of the music into those opportunities. Yeah, definitely. It's it's always worth exploring everything that you could do, right? And just seeing what happens, you know. Something comes might come of it, something might not, but if you don't try, you don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Jason, it's been really great chatting today. Really enjoyed the conversation. Is there anything else you'd like to leave the audience with as we close out? I think there's a yeah, obviously yeah, please check out the socials. So um if you head over to the website, which is simply jasoncallier.co.uk. Um, there's loads of links on there to uh, the latest singles, videos, and um, and content. 
perfect thanks jason appreciate your time okay thanks then see you then nice one thanks for watching everyone see you next time cheers bye-bye